Hello, everybody. Um, it's uh, we're doing uh, part six of Trouble in Ireland, the series I've been running. Uh, this is um, called the episode is called Stalemate or a New Game. Um, so Trouble in Ireland, Partition and its Consequences, episode six. So, um, in many respects, life in the six counties of Northern Ireland, it continued the, um, uh, after the conclusion of the 1981 hunger strikes, it seemed to continue on much as, as before. So, if you remember part five, uh, we were dealing with the Ulsterization policy, the criminalization policy of the British government direct rule system in the um, in in Northern Ireland. And so there was a general uh, reduction in the level of of uh, daily violence, uh, but uh, but the what what um, experts call low intensity conflict continued uh, at a very uh, it, depending on where you were and where where you were um, and who you were then you would you would experience it much more than if you were other people so um, so it was a localization what they called ulsterization and uh and a a um a, an attempt to to um to 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 drive the topic away from the attention of the media uh the british army and their local proxies carried on uh uh that local proxies such as the police uh, they acted in much the same way as in the picture opposite. You can see uh, this. This is quite a normal experience on, or quite a, a not a not an unsurprising experience um, on the Falls Road area, for instance, in in West Belfast. That's Beechmount, um, and there's some incident going on here. And the uh, police and the army are about, and one soldier has decided um, he's going to threaten uh, a member of the crowd. You can see a woman over there that he's uh, got his his rifle aimed at. And what they normally would do in a situation like this is that they would actually flick the uh, safety catch off and then back on again. Um, so, so this sort of gives you the terror of um, it's a it's a power game basically. So, so he he plays the power game, and and then he he sort of indicates, well, I could just end your life right now, and then he goes swings his rifle back back around again and carries on walking as though nothing had happened. Of course, that's not the way you experience it. You're probably traumatized by that for the rest of your life. Um, but but this is is quite a this is quite uh, nor, uh, normal a behavior that was being carried out by the security forces in certain areas it's, and um, it was generally in in um, nationalist or Catholic areas that you got this experience and um, the more working class you were um, then and especially the more politicized you were the more likely you were to experience such state terrorism, but it could happen to anybody. Uh, it, it, uh, it, wasn't, it wasn't that um, targeted. It could be quite indiscriminate. Um, however, there were um, some important differences which we can now discuss. So while the a provisional IRA was by no means defeated, and Republican prisoners had, after a truly epic struggle, achieved political status and at the same time delivered quite a severe blow to British strategy of Ulsterization. 
and marginalization. Um, its campaign to unite Ireland by force had ultimately failed. This lesson was not lost on the emerging political leadership. Unfortunately, it was not a lesson that could be admitted in public. So they had to keep up the uh, pretense that the IRA were going to win a victory, if not entirely militarily. It would have to be combined with politics. But um, but the military campaign would, would continue. Um, so because this is what the provisionals had supposedly split with the of officials back in 1970 um, was was over the use of um, of force to get the British out. And um, and now they were having to admit that, yeah, they would need some politics, but they didn't want to um, to uh, jettison the the arm the armed struggle uh, because because um, it would create problems inside the movement and um so so th they decided on this fudge which was called the armor light and the ballot, ballot box to sustain the traditional focus on the armed struggle while while attempting to replace the S sdlp which is social democratic labor party um which had evolved out of the nationalist party um, as uh, nationalism or, or the Catholic community's political leaders. Um, the Armalite in the Ballot Box strategy was actually developed by a man called Danny Morrison, and it, it achieved its first big success in 1983 with the election of Gerry Adams as MP for West Belfast. Uh, you can see that in the picture opposite there. And um, the, the strategy was to align the provosts along a left spectrum as socialists. Now, quite um, because they had been their philosophy previously, even though they they contained all, all sorts of elements, you know, both right and left wing elements before they had decided because of the emphasis on the armed struggle, they decided to to um, to shun politics until Ireland got its independence. And once they realized Ireland wasn't going to get its independence through through armed struggle, uh, then they uh, started to to um, develop a left, a, a more left um, perspective than they had before. The the previous uh, provisionals had had everybody from quite right wing elements to um, Maoists, in fact. Um, but anyway, um, they were. Uh, uh, but the by identifying as socialists they paradoxically were also adopting a version of the pan-class nationalist alliance um, that had unexpectedly elected Bobby Sands in 1981. And uh, so they wanted to repeat that, which meant um, effectively you couldn't do anything else anyway, uh, arguably because of the, of the sectarian divisions by this point, which were an extremely heightened uh, moment. But um, but in the, the um, so in the in the tightly controlled and pyramidal stru structure of the provisionals, uh, I do have to emphasize how tightly controlled and and pyramidal the structure it rem remains to this day. In fact, it's not. It's not a. It's um. It's quite tightly tightly controlled from the top down. Um. So Adam's first job was to gain control of the IRA. Um. And he 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 pretty much he spent most of the nineteen eighties doing that. Uh, and but by the sort of later nineteen eighties, he was well in, well in control of the IRA.
So, um, as we've already mentioned, in Adam, in, in, sorry, in reality, Adams had to tiptoe a very cautious path into electoral politics. This is the route he'd chosen, not necessarily um, a community, not a, so much of a community orientated um, left wing approach or a a, a, um, a union type um, left wing approach, but an electoral political. Uh, slant, which of course was what the officials had al already gone down and what they decided to do way back in 1970. So he had to tiptoe around this because uh, any indication that, that they were going in the same, in exactly the same direction as the officials would of course not go down well with the old guard physical force provost because uh, they might smell a rat and decide to split the movement uh, over it once again. So the armor light in the ballot box, um, Sinn Féin dogma that was being contrived to head off this storm, it meant that the that the RA would continue the armed struggle despite a now perceived need for some kind of transformation into electoralism, which is to be initially as a test was to be confined to Northern Ireland um, as a means, of course, an abstentionist one, uh, which would which would uh, just serve to to show that uh, the level of of support which the IRA actually had. In addition, a rift was forming with some of the prisoners. Um, who were going in a much further left direction than where Adams and uh, McGuinness on the outside. <clears throat> a few even felt that the pair were starting to play politics with the dead uh, from the prison struggle. Um, this wasn't a general thing, but it was a, a, an un uneasy feeling within some of the some of the ex ex prisoners. Um, and uh, the uh, or the or the prisoners who were still inside, and a lot of them were going in a much further left direction. They were reading very widely, and um, they were also internationalizing the whole the whole struggle much more than than Adams and McGuinness people were capable of doing, um, and. Uh, in, in the end, there will there will be a sort of um, quite a section of of the uh, of the Republican prisoners would actually form a, a Republican communist group once they once they got outside. So um, this does not mean to say that the RA, uh, as we've said you know because the RA campaign was was penetrated and and was um winding down in many ways because there were not so many volunteers um so it doesn't mean to say that they were no longer capable of having enough of an impact on world media to make sure they were not forgotten um, for despite all the deep penetrations by police and British military intelligence from the mid 1970s, they still had enough reliable elements, uh, skills and resources to be able to achieve desired uh, propaganda spectacles, if only uh, now on an intermittent basis. The most spectacular of these uh, is perhaps the 1984 Brighton bomb, uh, the Conservative Party annual conference, which of course received coverage worldwide. Um, and it ne nearly, um, it just narrowly missed engulfing the UK's Prime Minister, um, Margaret Thatcher, by only a few seconds. Uh, I believe that the bomb was actually in her bathroom. And it was uh, connected. The mechanism, I think, was connected to the to the to the, to the plunger on on the toilet. Um, and 
and um and i think there was a, some sort of a uh, um a mess up there and the and uh and the toilet um i think i think that chair had actually been sitting on the toilet um and and then uh, but 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 there was a delay uh, by a few seconds, but it was enough for her to get back into bed again, and she missed um, getting getting killed. In in contrast to earlier IRA botched attempts to bomb outside Ireland, such as Birmingham or Guildford, however. There were about three or four people killed in this, um, mostly high-ranking Tories. Um, in in a country that was in a bit, very bitter division over the ongoing miners' strike, a large major minority of UK public opinion was in satisfied approval of the chosen target. So, but local successes such as the Mortar attack in 1985 in Newry Barracks that killed nine RUC officers in one go. Um, this had much less impact due to the British austerization policy. Obviously, there had been at the time if there had been a more British soldiers in there, then then it would have been different. But um, but because it was local um, RUC or Royal Ulster Constabulary officers who were killed. Uh, the the rest of the media was not really that interested in it. And nor did the 1980s CNN to loyalist terror, terror attacks on random Catholics and their more orchestrated or state stroke loyalist uh, paramilitary assassinations of people it deemed uh, the state that is deemed were a threat to its own failed policies. One of the latter was the highly effective defence lawyer Pat Finucane, who even inside the rigged Northern Ireland court system, he won a uh, an alarmingly high number of cases that destroyed the so-called evidence that was being submitted in the bogus. Uh, Diplock courts that we talked about in part five. Uh, and for this, the sentence was death uh, as he was duly assassinated in 1989. We've never really got to the bottom of this um, and we probably never will as long as, uh, as Britain has any continued interests in Ireland. We now know that British policy has agreed behind closed doors in Whitehall since about 1973 was to reach some sort of joint settlement, re its unstable statelet in the northeast of Ireland. It wanted to sort of retain control of it. Then uh, the economic rationale for, for maintaining the, the, uh, the northeast of Ireland into connection to to England um, had disappeared quite some time ago um, probably at the end of the Second World War roughly um, it was even declining before the end of the Second World War um, and uh, you know since since about the 1930s in fact but but the um, uh, but but they wanted some sort of agreement um, with the with the republic and the nationalist opposition inside it in, inside it. Um, uh, but it was also prepared to spin this out for as long as it could to achieve a result that could be morphed in, by applying media into victory. Um, so, so the the um, the re re republic, um, the the um, you know the the economic situation was changing. The much more internationalization of of uh, 
finance and interna internationalization of, of manufacture. And uh, the, the Britain no longer needed the industries that had, uh, that had, had been very useful up, up until about the 1950s. Britain really had no, no, um, no need to sustain, sustain this. But if you think in terms of the, just in, in terms of simple, simple things to do with ideology and to do with um, how Britain perceives itself in the, in the world, the, you see, if they pulled out of Ireland completely, they would have to get rid of a um, one of the of the of the bars in the in the in the in the Union Jack. So so they would have to get rid of the red diagonal line that they have in there, um, which would not look good in for propaganda terms. So so the so so this was the real reason why this was all being continued. Um, and, and as long as not too many British soldiers were being killed, uh, and it was mostly local proxies and the British media establishment was, oh, sorry, the, the British establishment was untouched, then the long failed colonial military strategy of um, Kitson could be relentlessly continued to these ends. Uh, as it indeed was, regardless of the trauma suffered and the loss of life. The UK had already achieved its main aim of effectively neutralising the threat to the state posed by the 1960s, 70s uh, turbulences, so it could, it could afford to sit in its hands and wait, which is exactly what it did, right up until 1998. So regarding the by now largely successfully penetrated IRA and INLA, uh, the British state in the 1980s decided to eliminate the former's dwindling pool of effective uh, competence through a unit of, uh, sorry, through a policy of shoot to kill. Uh, that was the name of the strategy and carried out by SAS Special Forces, uh, a marriage of military intelligence to carefully staged ambushes by elite troops in a situation where deliberately no prisoners were to be taken. So an entire IRA active service unit uh, in South Tyrone was taken out uh, in 1986, I think, in Loch Gaw. And and uh, there was like 10, 10 people killed all at one go. And no prisoners were taken. They were they ambushed. The SAS knew, knew, knew exactly what they were going to do because a spy had told them or whatever. And they were um, all sitting there waiting and they just gunned them down. Um, one example that got out of control, however, was the 1988 in, 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 uh, interception of a half-planned IRA operation in Gibraltar, where the three volunteers involved, including uh, Marie Farrell, a, a woman, um, they were staked out and gunned down and finished off in the ground. Uh, due to the detailed intelligence gathered and the recon nature of the operation, the RA trio could have easily been arrested instead, but instead, but they just chose to shoot them down. Uh, the ordeal that followed to recover the bodies and to give them a decent burial in, in, in Belfast ended in an attack launched um, that's under full surveillance from the security forces. There, the um, I have to to add here that what had been happening in, previously at Republican funerals was that, uh, and there were quite a lot in this period because because of the 
of the uh, degree in which the British were operating their shoot to kill policy. The um, if the RA had a had a had a, a funeral, the the police would go straight in there and they would and they would uh, use use um, uh, their batons and their plastic bullet guns if necessary on the crowd and uh, and and so that was the general thing but this one the this 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 attack happened in Milltown cemetery in in West Belfast um the security forces were strangely absent apart from two helicopters that were um, circling overhead so the uh, and somehow a lone loyalist assassin um he he got down he wandered up uh, alone uh, heavily armed but alone he he wandered up from the from the motorway um there were there were um the this is all under uh, under observation from the from the helicopters who the like they were spy helicopters so so um so the british tried to pretend that they knew nothing about this but um you know uh, I was there and the helicopters were in the air because I remember them. So so this this uh picture here shows the uh he, he was armed with hand grenades and he also had a uh a pair of automatic pistols. He pulled out um the hand grenades first and then he started shooting and this show the the scene above shows some of this uh, happening at the time and this is another another picture because uh some of the crowd had given chase to him when he's tried to run away uh this is the assassin here and uh he's shooting at, at the crowd and there were in in the end there was three people killed um and 60 people injured by this man, he was eventually run down by the crowd and and given a, a baton. Um, that's the motorway from where he had emerged uh, at the start, uh, and with the police helicopter um, army helicopters overhead, I'm sure he was spotted. Um, it, and they, it, it seems to be that that he. He has said afterwards, he said um, that, that he had some help from the police. Um, this, this claim uh, is certainly feasible. So the assailant, um, you can see him on the left there. He was a rogue UDA volunteer by the name of Michael Stone, who, while laden down with hand grenades and pistols, allegedly walked along the adjacent motorway hard shoulder, while two um, police helicopters circled overhead and police were uh, patrolling up and down in their armored cars, uh, supposedly to prevent a security incident at the cemetery. Therefore, state of foreknowledge and collusion was and remains highly suspect, um, especially some with the illusions made by Stone himself. Stone shot dead three mourners in all, including two civilians and one IRA volunteer. The grenades he threw were randomly hurled, but he still wounded 60 plus people with blast stroke shrapnel, stroke flying masonry with from these or from his bullets. Uh, to emphasize one human contradiction in Britain's 1960s to 90s, refusal to resolve the botched border job of its own creation in Ireland. Um, and there are many of these actually, many, many of these strange mix ups um and nothing nothing is perhaps more baffling and disturbing than this picture on the left it shows a cousin uh jim todd was his name 
of the later IRA volunteer Bobby Sands, the former uh, being, that's Jim Todd, being at the coast at the time, a close friend of the aforementioned Michael Stone. You can see them both together in, in the picture. Around 1970, all three of them were playing football together in Rathcool, um, which is where Bobby Sands was. Um, and the, the uh, and, and Stone's best friends at the time were Catholics. Um, that all changed within a year. Um, and he suddenly became a loyalist paramilitary. And presumably Todd and Stone didn't see each other again, nor did Sands see them or see, see, uh, see Stone. Uh, so Sands went on to die on hunger strike in 1981 and Stone tried to commit an indiscriminate massacre at a Republican funeral. What got most publicity, however, was not the attack on funeral mourners and the deaths, injuries of these, but an incident at a few at two further IRA funerals the next day. So two off-duty soldiers of the British Army Signals Regiment seemed to drive a car into the fun funeral cortege. You can see that above. And people immediately thought it would be a repeat of the day before. The two British soldiers panicked, attempted to drive away before being blocked off by black taxis, and they pulled out their pistols. Um, but by this time, they pretty much signed their death warrants by a driving into a, a crowd in a in an apparently aggressive manner, and then. Um, producing pistols. So they were dragged out of the car and beaten up by the crowd. Um, the IRA came along, they intervened. They took the soldiers to a nearby gym where they were interrogated and then they were quickly shot. Uh, this created a storm in the British press that saw a great opportunity to portray the Irish once again as animals and to distract attention from the obvious state collusion on the previous day. It's never been in satisfactory explained what the two soldiers were doing there in the first place. Uh, I have it from information from somebody who was connected to British Army at the time. They said that, that, uh, that this was actually quite normal behavior for uh, the soldiers were asked to volunteer to do dress up in city clothes and get in in cars and trail people and so on and so forth so it's quite likely that um that the two soldiers because they weren't sas or anything like this they were just ordinary signals regiment soldiers um and um the it, it seems quite likely that they were told to 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 follow somebody or to to just keep a low profile around the fringes but they took a wrong turning and they ended up where they are but this has never been admitted by the british that they were on such a mission um on the political front and prodded to do so by its us allies irish american constituency because um, Ronald Reagan was under pressure from them. Uh, Britain felt the need to cover its reluct reluctance to act with any significance by reinventing the 1973-4 Sunningdale talks, but this time giving them more publicity and a bit more leverage. So it was, it was basically a, another, another front operation just to, to keep people happy. The SDLP were still the biggest nationalist party and the OUP were the, still the biggest unionist one. And both were pliable to, uh, to um, achieving a peace that allowed limited joint consultation with Irish civil servants over decisions to be made in the province. Um, very, very superficial, very much window dressing 
um, operation. But um, and um, and and using the the sort of respectable end of the nationalist community, that's John Hume on the left, and the respectable end of the unionist community, which would be uh, David Trimble on the right there. So Ian Paisley of the DUP saw um, he, he'd been left out by all this, uh, the Democratic Unionist Party. He saw his big opportunity and he applied all the force of his charisma and publicity skills to stage manage a huge Ulster says no campaign aimed to show rank and file Protestant rejection of such a deal. So he, he was getting on with that. A lot of the mid 1980s was taken up with him uh, and his his uh, following uh, organizing big big rallies and stuff in, in, in Belfast to to get the media attention and so on and so forth and to detract um attention from from David Trimble in 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 particular because he wasn't and to make sure that he wouldn't achieve what what he was trying to do or supposedly trying to do. Um so John Hume and David Trimble, they heralded the uh, 1985's Anglo-Irish agreement with the with the UK government and uh, involving um, some representation from Irish Rep Republic. Uh, the problem was that the British were, at least in, as far as the media were concerned, not necessarily what was going on in private, as we'll discover later, but uh, they were excluding Sinn Féin IRA. So Sinn Féin IRA were, were, were bad boys and or bad girls, uh, and they didn't want to... Um, they, they said that they weren't going to give them any, any acknowledgement. So, so there was a, a, a campaign that started up in the 1980s in both the Republic and, and in... And in uh, um uh and in and in British media as well to to uh to exclude um to prevent anybody who supported in in support of the armed struggle, which of course the provisionals were doing so, um it, it refused to give them any airtime or or video time or whatever. And uh, so they're basically to be censored. Um, and Paisley's growing DUP, although they couldn't censor them, um, they were also still in the margins. Um, so not surprisingly, the political process stalled yet again because they weren't prepared to acknowledge that there were different shades of opinion, um, both within the nationalist community and within the unionist community. So um, this this is to do with the censorship um, in the period. The um, the the it actually the the decision to to uh, deny publicity and deny um, uh, free speech essentially to 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 people who supported the armed struggle in in Northern Ireland. Uh, that was actually started in, in the Republic. It was, there was a piece of legislation known as Section 31. Um, and that that was what, um, what what gave the British the idea, oh well we can we can impose this on on, on our TV and, and, and on our radio as well. And the so so this this uh, this war mural here uh, gives you gives a representation of that at the time how how that was uh, it being experienced by the republican movement. So so you've got the the figure with a with a a gag on a Union Jack gag. And then the gag is removed and they're talking peace. 
There, there we are. So since the end of the 1970s and across most of the 1980s came a series of supported allegations involving high-ranking orange uh, William William McGrath. You can see him over on the on the right. Um, yeah, he was he was not only was he a high-ranking orangeman, he was also involved in loyalist paramilitary groups, an ex ex exceptionally uh, extreme one, in fact, known as Tara. And he ran a he also was um, he he ran a a home for 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 boys at Kinkora in in the heart of East Belfast. So the young and vulnerable boys there who uh, were uh, had troubled troubled uh, homes um, or who were in fact orphans were 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 taken there. And um, and instead of of getting care and support, they were subjected to rape and other inhuman treatment by McGrath and some of his staff. What made the leaks about this particularly volatile? Now this has been going on since the late nineteen seventies. There have been hints that this was going on, and it's finally bubbled over the top in the during the 1980s and there was there was a series of revelations regarding this throughout the 1980s um and they um they revealed that several inmates claimed they were being abused uh not only by the staff but also by unionist politicians in northern ireland and being tra trafficked to to established child political uh, lead connected child abusers in Britain. It was and remains suspected that due to the police being in the know and the cover up, other parties, namely British military intelligence, were also aware, if not involved in. Because if you think about it, you know, if, if you know about all this stuff, then it's much easier to to manipulate political leaders if you if you have have this this dirt which you can spill on them so in the republic as well uh the tales of abuse and inhuman treatment um originating with the uh, um inside the Catholic, Catholic Church. Um, so together with the state and the clergy hierarchy, um, was this was starting for the first time to get airtime and press coverage. It had been impossible to do that before, but in the 1980s, this started, this lid started to come off in the Republic. And of course, some of it also involved stuff going on in Northern Ireland. So um, the first in this long and still bubbling overflow was the Kerry Babies Affair of 1984, where the Gardaí, that's the Irish uh, Republic's police, they framed a case of murder against the mother of a dead infant who was born out of wedlock. And there was a big big exposure of that <clears throat> the end excuse me <clears throat> the end results of all this were still to materialize but the old awe that had been offered up to priests and the clergy in the past in both parts of Ireland they were fast disappearing um as the 1980s drew to a close and the 1990s began, uh, a, a situation of chess-like stalemate endlessly repeating with military advantage to the British state, but no checkmate possible. And this combined with the continued economic social stagnation, um, public morale on both sides, in scare quotes, sank to new lows. 
So only if you were in the small minority insulated by wealth or if you were making power or money out of the deadlock were you cushioned from this atmosphere. It was quite a it was quite an impressive period. Uh, little did we know that another secret game was being set up that involved all the big players involved, but we but it was being staged out of our sight. We were supposed to carry on um, living and dying in futility and ignorance of what was going on. In the all pervading alienation, social problems were getting worse. Uh, drugs began to circulate widely, involving gangland factions of the UDA, UVF, and now uh, f rapidly fragmenting INLA. Uh, the Provo response was to add armed muscle to the community response in a typically heavy handed manner, such as kneecappings. You can see a simulation of a kneecapping. Above, it's not a new, real kneecapping, but this was, this is typical of what it involved. If it was um, with done with guns, sometimes it was done with hurley sticks, or if you were in a loyalist area, it might be done with um, cricket bats or baseball bats or something like this. Um, <clears throat> so the the um, but the. The contribution to social breakdown by the Provos themselves with their drinking clubs, because uh, most of the social problems in 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 Ireland at the time were not related to, to drugs, they were related to drink. Um, but but the drinking clubs were when were not to be criticized, um, and the subject was not even to be raised. Uh, joyriding became a fav favorite pastime of unemployed youth, and if they avoid avoided being kneecapped by the param param paramilitaries, then they risked summary execution at the hands of state forces. You can see one of these incidents over on the left. I think there were four people in that particular car, um, three, three, three boys and a girl. And they were all gunned down um, in a um, when they reached an army checkpoint and were speeding along in the car. Uh, we we'll, we'll now talk a little bit about peace lines. Now you can see some of the of the biggest peace lines here here on the on the map. Um, now these were were uh, th these were brought in by the by the British Army initially um, to they had temporary divisions, very basic ones with uh, barbed wire um, along streets, um, you know, and, and and foot patrols along along streets where the where the chances of, of violence was supposed to be particularly bad. This is mostly in North Belfast. You can see this is, uh, you, 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 you can see the divisions there are strongest in, in um, the yellow lines. The, these are the big peace lines. There are lots of very small peace lines which um, have come into practice much later on, and the and the reinforcement and um, and and uh, it, it expansion of these, which we will also be dealing with in a minute. Um, but you can see that the uh, the sectarian geography, as far as working class areas are concerned, you can see the the uh, the the uh, the the main divisions. So, so you've got one in East East Belfast, um, and you've got, ooh, ooh, uh, and the rest are all, all, almost entirely North Belfast, which is much more fragmented in terms of which areas are which, um, and ooh, the and along the boundaries of um, North 
uh, or of of West Belfast um, on the on the left. So to get a more realistic picture of what the peace line actually means, perhaps a photo like the one on the right might start to bring it home to everyone. It came to mean in this period a near permanent wire struck fence line between communities along perceived lines of separation with sparsely distributed gates. These were locked during night hours. Sometimes in some places there are no gates. Uh, peace lines make the uh, geographical divisions initially forged in a flashpoint moment of tension, they make them perpetual or means to reproduce partition again, arguably, this time internally, however. So city planning was slowly weaved into the requirements of state security and those of um, also of sectarian political identity. And they helped to reinforce those and they helped to, to, um, to make, make these permanent. What better way to keep people um, with a perceived sectarian identity apart? and unable to realize how much they had in common with those on the other side of the wall, or even to forget why the wall had existed in the first place. So you just, after a while, you, you accept something like this as um, because, you know, uh, it, it just becomes, it becomes uh, part of a normal life even though it's completely abnormal. So in this way, urban planning, a supposedly neutral and beneficial agent got hijacked to suit the agendas of political and eventually also private contractor agents rather than the communities it was supposed to serve. The community became an alienated object for manipulation and future planned divisions. So later on, uh, private contractors got involved in all this. And of course they were making money out of it. And uh, so, it, it, and, um, and of course, if you've got these divisions, it makes life for people who play on sectarian politics, it makes life easier for them as well. Um, against all of this stuff that we've been talking about, there was a resurgence of uh, punk rock. If you remember, we analysed that briefly in part five, uh, which had erupted at the end of the 1970s. Um, this was much more of what you might call hardcore um, punk and uh, politicised around a resistance to repression, no matter where it came from. Um, the anarchist scene around war, the, the war zone collective and just books in Belfast formed the cutting edge of this movement. So you can see some of them there over on the left. Um, another cultural resistance movement that took shape around the from the early to mid 1990s was the rave stroke dance scene. Um, this focused on young teenagers for the most part, uh, getting loaded on MDMA or similar dance euphoria drugs and dancing the night away in full hedonistic form. Uh, this is a, this is an international movement. It is particularly strong in Europe and um, in the US and I think Canada and places, you know, um, this was all uh, very much a, a um, international movement. And the, the, the forms of music were the, the rave music and the, um, the techno and, and other, other electronic forms of music, um, hip hop. 
as with as with punk the the fact that the young people were showing initiative of their own and did not care a damn about their ascribed political or sectarian labels was seen as a fundamental threat and moral panic by all political groups involved. Um, so a strange alliance of clergy and politicians of all ideologies, police and paramilitaries contrived to drive the rave scene out of business uh, and to stop any prospect of their young people having a good time. The scene was apolitical and amorphous, but it was also interesting because it was non-hierarchical and predominantly working class. And it was also very profoundly anti-sectarian. Now, this couldn't be tolerated. So on the outskirts of West Belfast, for example, a free party centre took shape in Colin Glen and in an old brickwork factory known thereafter as Hippie Quarry. Uh, people came here to party from all over Belfast. The IRA, however, threat, felt this was a threat. They probably felt that, oh, young people taking drugs there and all the rest of it. So they so they went in, in there <clears throat> and uh, eventually closed it all down. Uh, by spraying, spraying the entire place with uh, gallons of agricultural slurry. So while the northern state was stagnating in the 1990s, the Republic seemed to be showing some signs of economic recovery. Now this was lauded by its politicians and media pundits as a sure sign that the time was right for Ireland's entry into the world economy and that the neoliberal policies that they were advocating would turn the 26 counties into a Celtic tiger. You can see the picture on the left. Um, this picture is actually very revealing, um, unintentionally, I think, but um, the uh, you notice that the, the tiger's head um, conveniently obscures the strange uh, formation in the in the northeast of Ireland known as the uh, as Northern Ireland and um, and its its claws are dug into the rest of Ireland which is um, which you could argue is um, is a bit like a tiger's prey or something um, so and of course, its main its main um, uh, its the center of its body is in is in Dublin, which of course exactly was um, where most of this so called Celtic Tiger stuff was was happening. So the the expansion of Dublin into a centre for European finance and the planting of electronic computer industries, even in rural areas, uh, this all seemed for these enthusiastic commentators to point to new opportunities and an escape for Ireland from its former neo-colonial dependency status. So, you know, you all be free now because instead of all your resources being being sucked into Britain, um, they're being sucked into uh, into Europe um, or any anybody who wants to invest in Ireland. So the the. Um, so surely this embrace of capitalist moder modernism was what Sean Lamas had dreamed of back in the 1960s. Come back, Sean, all is forgiven. The reality, however, was somewhat different from the fanfare, which you can see this is um, a cartoon on the right. Though it took some time before the Celtic Tiger propaganda well ran dry. What was being ignored was that the capital, the so-called tiger was attracting, was transnational in nature and in particular originated either from developed EU nations or from the USA. 
whose motive for locating to Ireland rested solely on the huge slashes made to tax during this period. So yes, jobs were being created, but they were insecure. There was never enough of them, and there was no investment go coming back to the national infrastructure to create a genuinely Irish pool of capital. So basically, all the capital that it was generating was being sucked out of the country. Uh, indeed, one could argue the country's old dependency on others was arguably just, arguably just being reproduced, this time in a different, i.e. neoliberal form. As regards the Catholic Church, by the mid-1990s, it seemed that the kind of Ireland where Pope John the Paul II, um, on the left there, in his Pope Mobile, he had been able to some muster a million crowd, strong crowd in 1979 to, to, to welcome his arrival. But this was fast receding into the Celtic twilight. Contraceptives were by now both legal and widely available. Divorce shortly followed. And calls were being made for a revision to, of the Constitution, e even on, on, on abortion. It is worth pointing out that the latter was at the time illegal in both parts of Ireland, and that is abortion, with the hypocritical understanding that Irish women so inclined could easily make the a journey across the Irish Sea to Britain and obtain one there. So the local uh, people who thought that they were very moral and all the rest of it, they could, they could just um, avoid avoid taking responsibility. Uh, and that's in both parts of Ireland, not, not just in the Republic, by the way. The exposure of abuse, sexual or and otherwise, by priests and nuns continued apace in the, this decade, and attendance at mass fell accordingly, particularly amongst the young. The case of Father Brendan Smith was one in point where the abuser um, was sheltered by a Norbertine abbey in the, in, in the Republic after fleeing justice in the North uh, from some of his attacks that he'd made on children that had um, been exposed in 1991, and he did a bunk. Um, and the Fianna Fáil government, they botched his extradition up right royally. He eventually handed himself over to the uh, Royal Ulster Constabulary. You can see that taking place uh, in the picture. And it, um, and the and the government itself was thrown out of office in the scandalous aftermath. <clears throat> right. The Republic of Ireland was not the only place affected by the wave of optimism generated by the neoliberal globalization gig economy fanfare. And languishing business interests in the North, too, were enthused enough to push once again for achieving the peace that would be necessary to fully exploit them. What had escaped everyone's notice, in fact, was that secret negotiations to reach a settlement had been going on since the late 1980s at least. Um, the initial moves in this direction were largely the work of a Quaker group in Derry who had put enormous and thankless effort into the project for 10 years or more. Um, that is being acting as a medium to send political messages backwards and forwards undercover between all the different groups involved. So this was carrying on while IRA volunteers were still being killed. And it was while, while civilians were still being killed by um, British Army and police, um, while punishment beatings were still going on, while there was this general uh, uh, this general 
collapse of of um, of of morale in in Ireland, um, and it's allowed to to carry on because the uh, the politicians wanted to 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 have a um, they they um, they wanted to to um, to to steal the limelight basically and they wanted to pretend that the initiative um which they hadn't never admitted in public um had originated out solely out of their own 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 energies and then they could reveal it all in a big in a big um big big fanfare so Sinn Féin by now had the nationalist majority vote and the DUP or Democratic Unionist Party, they had the unionist majority. So the officials were slowly being edged out. And the Adams and uh, and Paisley teams were finally on board. Negotiation shuttlecocks flew between the many teams of actors, each in their own court. This is, this is in the period 1996 when it first came out into the open. And 1998. Um, so the Good Friday Agreement of 1988 was simply a frillier, more comprehensive 1985 agreement, except that it would be led by celebrities such as US President Bill Clinton and British PM Tony Blair amid great hype. The IRA would disarm in return for place at the table, and the DUP's Ulster would say perhaps maybe instead of just no. So Adams had managed to get rid of the old uh, Sinn Féin old um, uh, people who were against uh, the political direction in 1986 with minimal re repercussions. This is when they they first started to contest uh, elections in the in the in the um, in the republic as well as in Northern Ireland. And arguably, the uh, 1996 Canary Wharf bomb this helped essay, uh, Sinn Féin's negotiative clout. That was why it was carried out, because uh, the British didn't want, because uh, this was another uh, another publicity event which reached world media attention and the British didn't want that because by this point, the British economy was in fact largely dependent on, on the city of London. <laughs> um, but, but then in 1998, the inevitable split in the IRA occurred. A significant, at this point, a significant sized group who had similarly, who had previously rather been, been uh, hidden their discontent, they, they suddenly announced they didn't trust the leadership anymore and they were determined to carry on the armed struggle alone. The result was the Omar bomb atrocity on the left. I think this was 1999, uh, which actually forced the loyal IRA, those those loyal to Adams, to decommission faster and with less concessions than they previously enjoyed at the table. Um, as always in the murky world of so-called low-intensity conflict, ambiguity reigns over this massacre. And whether it was a spectacularly botched operation, IRA was certainly capable of launching botched operations, quite a few in their, in their history, um, or whether the, the fact that a later revealed double agent uh, that the British state double agent was involved, has any significance at all, is still unknown. Only one thing is certain, that any tolerance of IRA operations by most nationalists 
was no longer tenable. So finally, the Stormont Assembly was reconvened at the end of the millennium. So this is roughly between uh, 1998 and 2007, this teething, teething uh, period took, took place. Um, this time it would have checks and balances to prevent, prevent sectarian dominance by either, either team. Um, and it would feature the DUP, the Democratic Unionist Party, as a majority party uh, through the elections that were being carried out and with the premiership falling to Ian Paisley and his um, successors. And Sinn, Sinn Féin as the main nationalist opposition party. Um, and these would always, and they, so the Sinn Féin man, you can see Martin McGuinness there on, on the left, see Ian Paisley uh, at the top. Um, he's, he's the new premier of Northern Ireland. Um, and Tony Blair giving his uh, ghastly grin yeah, on, on the right. Um, and so, so a um, so Sinn Fein, in order to get this, they had agreed to recognize the six county state until a majority, uh, electorally had decided to end partition by referendum. And he, they also agreed to recognize a new non sectarian police force. Um, many teething troubles occurred between its refounding, that's Stormont's refounding, and uh, 2007, mainly based around alleged breaches and disputes over the Parades Commission that had been set up to uh, resolve Orange March related disputes as from 1998. One cannot but wonder what it was exactly that those thousands on all sides have been killed for over this period of 30 years, and just to achieve what had essentially been on the cards since 1973. Was it simply to satisfy the egoist ambition of a man such as Ian Paisley in the middle there, to allow slick Sinn Féin politicians like uh, Martin McGuinness uh, to evolve out of the IRA role of honour or to give Britain the pompous revenge and self-justification that it sought because it could, it could uh, present all this, oh, we achieved all this and it was great and Tony Blair was right in there and and even though he was just the cherry on the top of the cake, um, and uh, that the and they they basically they, they could have done this back in 1973, but instead they they let let everybody suffer right up until 1998. Um, so so these pertinent questions have still to be answered. That's all for this episode, and we will continue with our final episode, part seven, uh, in, in due course. Thank you.